All right, so we are rolling. Welcome to the Brother Ben X Show. Today we're going to be interviewing our big brother, Brother Tony X. We're going to hear about his background. I uh, want to talk about your story going to prison, yes, sir. Uh, finding the teachings, and then you know your journey coming out. So uh, tell us your name and a little bit about your upbringing. Okay, my name is Brother Tony X. I was born in Denison, Texas, right outside of Dallas, Texas. I was raised in Oak Cliff. It's a neighborhood in, our, in the Dallas area, the metroplex called Oak Cliff, Texas. Uh, I went to the school of Albert Sidney Johnston. That was my elementary school. My junior high school was Oliver Wendell Holmes, and my high school was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. I graduated two years late. My mother was a single parent, a beautiful woman. She did domestic work. She cleaned houses, uh, took care of white folks, as most of our parents did. Uh, she was abused. Uh, when she was a child, she was born in San Angelo, Texas. They put her in a trash can, and uh, she survived through that. Thank Almighty God, Allah. Uh, like I say, my high school, my education, I was raised around drugs, uh, all kinds of marijuana, uh, pills. My neighbors, everybody, bootleg and all that. That was the environment that I grew up in, in Roosevelt, uh, in the Oak Cliff, I mean. I graduated two years late, and I take pride in my graduating two years late, right? I began my drug life at the age of probably about eight, nine, ten, gambling, seeing uh, people smoke weed, drinking beer, all that kind of stuff, right? At the typical uh, uh, ring in a neighborhood. I basically raised myself. I didn't have to go to school unless I wanted to go to school. My mother taught me a lot of principles, a lot of things. She told me uh, as a child, if you make a bed, you're going to sleep in it. She told me a hard head make a soft behind. But I didn't know what those things meant at that time. Uh, fast forward, uh, in 1985, a friend of mine that I grew up with named uh, Zachary Scott, he has a brother named Roddy Scott. They were from Bunton in South Dallas. They used to live in Oak Cliff, and their mother was a drug addict, and she used to shoot hair on. We would go over their house as children and see how indecent the house was and how she was shooting up. That's the type of environment I grew up in. But this little brother... Uh, Zeke, we call him Zeke. He moved to South Dallas, and he came back to Oak Cliff. With at that time, the rims were center lines. Uh, we were driving cutlasses, right? And he came back with that and the booming music. That's when they take the whole back seats out, put the Sarah Vegas in the in the cars. And as he pulled up one day, and he had what we call a dookie rope, right? A great big hollow rope with big symbol on it, and a lot of money. And I looked at him. I said, "Man, what you what you doing?" Right? He said, "Man, I'm up, man." I said, what is up? He said, I'm having money now. What are you doing? And he was selling crack cocaine. That's when it exploded, right? That's when the crack came out. So eventually, I started selling a drug called PCP or wet. They call it Gorilla Piss, wet. Those are the nicknames for it. And as I began to sell that, we was working for a guy out of South Dollars by the name of JoJo. He was a pimp, wore a lot of jewelry, Cadillacs, and all of that. And uh, that's how I was raised, right? So fast forward, I, I went to school, I graduated two years late, tried and strived to do right, got on probation, stealing cars, average teenager. Uh, I saw my father two times in my whole life. When I went to federal prison, I found out that my father was a police officer. Uh, and that was interesting too, all praise be to God. But uh, that's basically it, that's how I grew up. Then I eventually became, in, uh, I started selling drugs for the Jamaicans. So hey. now, hold on, yes. we're gonna, we gonna get there. Yes, um, you talked about growing up in a, in a single household, only seeing your father two times. Two times, yes sir. How did that affect you growing up? Hmm, that's, that's a good question. Cause uh, the first time I saw him, I was living at 1717 Sutherland, right across the street from the Cedar Crest Golf Course. And he, I was so excited when my mother told me, your daddy coming over here. I'm like, what? I've been thinking about this man my whole life. I was about nine years old, right? He comes, buy me a six pack, and I always wanted to go to Jack in the Box. Took me to Jack in the Box. And then he said, I'll be back tomorrow. And I never saw him again. The second time I saw him, I was 17 years old, right? Uh, I was two years behind in, in schooling. And my sister woke me up. We were living on Avenue E, right off uh, 11th Street in Oak Cliff. She comes in the house, she wakes me up, my baby sister. 
And she said, your daddy outside. And now I'm 17. So this was uh, the time by 9, 8, and I see him again at 17. And I saw him, and I said, he was a well-groomed man, tie, New Yorker, nice clean car, clean cut. And I didn't even speak to him. I said, say, man, I'm hungry, man. Right? He said, I'll be back. I'm going to go cash my check. And I never saw him again. And I'm 55 years old. Now, the way that affected me is I never knew what a man was, right? So I was, I grew up in an environment where it's every man for himself. It's a doggy dog world. I got to get mine, you got to get yours. So that's how I grew up in the way it affected me. It affected me in a way like I don't know what a man is. So all I know is abusing women, being a womanizer, selling all the drugs I can, making all the money I can. Fight anybody, shoot anybody, didn't make me any difference. So the way it affected me, it really, it handicapped me. But I didn't know I was handicapped, right? And, and by, I thank, I thank God for him doing what he did. I thank God because I hated my father. I also hated my mother. But Minister Farrakhan made me love my mother and my father and gave me understanding. So one would understand why you would, you know, possibly hate your father, but your mother mm -hmm. kind of going to why you will feel that way about your mother. Oh, praise be the Lord. Uh, we as men and we as children, our children have expectations of us. So as a parent, we would say, I want you to go to school. I want you to graduate. I don't want you hanging around nobody doing bad. I don't want you selling drugs. That's as a parent. But as a child, when you don't see your mother, see, and I'm expecting my mother to be a mother. I want food, I want clothing, I want shelter. And she wasn't, she wasn't able to provide that. But I didn't understand until I met Minister Farrakhan in 1995 over a video. Prior to that, I met him in 1994 over a video and over TV screens. Prior to that, I, I heard about him in 1989 when I was in prison. But I didn't pick up on it until 1995. And uh, he made me, I hated her because I didn't think that she was doing what she was supposed to do. You follow me? And it really hurt me. So I'm like, that ain't my mother. That ain't my father. The hell, you know, when you don't see your father, you're like, the hell with him. You don't see your mother, the hell with him. There were days that I didn't see my mother for two weeks. There were days that we would be, in, when I would come home from school, there'd be a notice on the door, like Mo 3. You see, an eviction notice on the, store, on the door. You got to get out. Now, how am I going to pay the rent? I'm seven, eight years old, nine years old, ten years old. So that's where that hatred came from. But when I met Minister Louis Farrakhan and he began to tell me his story about his mother, that's what allowed me to love my mother. You follow me? How were you able to survive at seven, eight years old by, by yourself, you know, in the home by yourself? What were some of the things that you, or some of the experiences and things you had to go through? Okay, that, that's a beautiful question. You know where Sunnyvale is? It's some, some apartments called Prince Hall Apartments. That was our first apartment that I can remember. We lived in General Reno, Spanish Church. We moved all over Oak Cliff. But the way I survived is what she taught me. I didn't know she was preparing me. I didn't know I was going to be a hustler. I didn't know that uh, how to fight because I, I was bullied when I was a child. We used to live in Southern Oaks before they tore them down and rebuilding it. And I was bullied, right? And I was so glad when we moved because I'm like, man, I'm tired of these dudes messing with me, right? And I'm a little fella, right? So when I moved and then I moved to a certain part of Oak Cliff, that's where I began to learn how to fight and how to survive and some of the stuff that she was instilling in me but I didn't know what she was instilling in me. You follow me? So she taught me how to read. She taught me how to type. She taught me how to wash dishes. She taught me how to tie my shoes. She was teaching me and training me because she knew what I needed to know in order to make it through this. So the way I survived is by people that I didn't know that I called my family. You follow me? Kevin Williams, a professional football player for the Dallas Cowboys, uh, two Super Bowl rings. His mother was a, a devoted Christian. Right, and she used to always pull me out of all the children, pull me in the house, and read the Bible to me, and tell me that I was the leader. So it was other women. It was people that I, that my mother, they were her friend, but I would call them Aunt Mary. You follow me? So it takes a village. So the village raised me. So now to this day, some of them are past me. A lot be pleased with them. Some of them are not. But those women, their children, and me, they call me uncle. They call me brother. They call me cousin. I got a cousin. I went to see him yesterday. Uh, my number one uh, uh, partner in crime, I would say, he's paralyzed. He used to have diamonds in his mouth. They called him Little James. His real name is James Holmes. His mother's name was Mary, right? Reason I, I thank Almighty God a lot, she helped me survive. She instilled values in me. She put God in me. But there were a lot of people that were from Oak Cliff and from different parts of the world that put God in me, but I didn't know what they were doing.
You follow me? So that's how I survived. I used to live with them. She fed me. She clothed me. She even moved my whole family in. My mother, my, my mother, my brother, and my sister. She moved us all into the house, and their family became our family. So we were living in a three-bedroom house, 541 Moore Street, right? And it was about three or four families. So the way I survived were other people in the community helping me and raising me until I was able to do for myself. This makes me think of a quote uh, that blood don't make your family. You can teach. Or whatever the quote is. Yes, sir. When you hear that, mm -hmm. because of your upbringing, what comes to mind for you? Mm, it, it, it makes me think of blood is thicker than mud, right? The most honorable minister, Louis Farrakhan, I'm, you're going to hear me mention him all the time because I love it. You follow me? And uh, I can't even really mention his name without crying, but I'll pray be the law. But uh, blood is thicker than mud. See, when we think about family, Brother Ben got children. We think about family, Brother Tony got children. See, but when something, when your children are wrong, when you correct your children, regardless of the circumstances, you follow me? So, so truth knocks the brains out of falsehood. You follow me? So I, I'm, I always, I always been one that was on truth. I never cared about money. My brother and them used to get money and do things. I ain't care about no money. But then I started getting money, and then that I made that money my God. So I'm a type of person with principles. I don't care who you are. If you ain't about truth, I really don't like you. If you don't stand for truth, I really don't like you. I don't care if it's my son. I don't care if it's my daughter. I don't care if it's my cousin. I don't care if it's my mother. I'm going to tell you the truth. You're going to have to take it or leave it alone. I don't want to disrespect you, but I'm all about that truth. So when you say blood is thicker than mud or blood is family, blood don't make you right. You follow me? That's just your genetic makeup. That's not who you are. Follow me? We all were created in truth. And even if we don't think right, then our minds are destroying themselves. Or our mind, excuse me, our brains are being deteriorated because we're not using them right. You follow me? So that's what it made me think of family. The minister, is, man, is so beautiful because he's showing us. When I say the minister, I'm talking about Farrakhan. He's showing us brothers like me and you. You follow me? He brings us together. I ain't know you. You was a basketball player. I met you in prison. I read all like, damn, what is that little brother? Brother, you're getting it. You follow me? But you're doing the work. That's why I love you so much. Can't nobody come tell me nothing bad about Brother B. I ain't going to listen. Can't nobody tell me nothing bad about Farrakhan. I'm not going to listen because I know your heart. So I look at the people's heart. I got a, a cousin, Kevin Williams. I got another cousin. And these are like cousins, brother. They'll tell you, man, that's my big cousin. Two Super Bowl rings. That made me feel good. I helped put him through college. Gave him money. Make me feel good. I helped my cousin Isaac Williams, a professor at a college. That made me feel good. Dwight Jones. So those are the people that raised me, and that's my family. My wife is my family. You follow me? Got my back no matter what. Gone five years in prison. She right there holding the trucks down, paying for stuff that she didn't have to pay for, sending me books and literatures and newspapers. So that's what I think about family. It's the way that we think. You follow me? What's going, what, what's going on in your mind at that time around the age seven and eight? Because, mm -hmm. you know, as, we, as we're older, mm -hmm. in our mind, we know that's wrong. But as a seven to eight-year-old, do you think that is this normal? Mm -hmm. Because, like, this is the environment that you grew up in? Or did you know, like, I'm not supposed to be in this house by myself? That's a real good question, bro, Ben. You're going deep now. There's a store on City Crest and Keys. The time was 1976. I say 1900 because I got that from one of my partners off of uh, uh, Lancaster. His name is Tory, Little Tory. Little Tory is a car salesman. That's where I get the 1900 from, right? So I say 1976, I'm living in, at, uh, on City Crest and Keys. It was a dirt road right there, but there was a store there called Big World. And I used to go in Big World and steal so I can eat. We stole so much in those apartments that it put the store out of business, right? Now, I say that to say this. As I went into that store, there was a self-accusing spirit. I can understand it now, but I ain't understanding it at the age of seven. And you get a, a, a butterflies in your stomach when you're doing something wrong. I'm talking about it's scary. But once you get past the butterflies, oh, it's natural. So now when I was getting the butterflies, I was alive, right? Because I knew it was wrong. But when I stopped getting the butterflies, then I, I no longer knew that it was wrong. I didn't even care if it was wrong. Because my thing was, I got to eat, man. I ain't ate in three days. So when you say that, it, it puts me back into survival mode, stealing bicycles and taking the, the, uh, the bicycle to the pawn shop, right? And getting $10, $15 and go buy me a sack of weed, $5 sack at that time, commercial weed, and then go buy my sister something to eat because I ain't saw my mama. 
So that's that's how, I, and then when I came into the nation of Islam, fast forward, and we learned about the self-accusing spirit, chapter 75 in the Holy Quran, the resurrection, follow me? So it's not a physical resurrection, but it's a mental resurrection. And when you mentally resurrect it, then you become aware. Oh, that's wrong. Then you begin to reflect back and look back on your life and rewind the tape in your mind and see, man, all that stuff that Allah God brought me through. All that stuff that whoever you say is God, Jehovah, uh, Allah, God, whatever you want to call him, he brought you through. But he never left you because he was always in you. But we didn't know where he was and we couldn't connect with him. So that's what it makes me think of. Praise be to Allah. Your, your first time you said you, you, you selling drugs, what was that first instance? Was it like Nah, I ain't going to do it. Was it easy to do? Because you was always around it. How was that first time experience? It was it was, it was, was scary. Because I promised myself I'm not going to sell drugs. I didn't start out selling drugs. I started out using drugs. Mm -hmm. I was a weed addict. I didn't fit. I used to pop lock. They called me cut lip. Right, so I was dancing. Couldn't nobody beat me dancing. At that time, we had clubs like the second stage, uh, uh, down and under, uh, uh, that's, those are a couple of the clubs at the time. But back then it was break dancing, it was pop locking, right? And as I was break dancing and pop locking, I was always in survival mode. So then I started selling drugs. I'm already popular now, being on all the talent shows, right? So now I started going into the drug world. When I, it's scary, but I, went, I started smoking weed, drinking. Then crack came out, and you get the crack rock and crunch it up and lace it up with the weed, roll it up. And you would, when you light it up, now it gives you a euphoria. You feel uh, incredible. You feel so good, right? Now, notice that I'm doing crack, but peer pressure came from one of my partners, right? We call him uh, 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 Tracy Barton, right? I'm, I'm giving it all to you. I ain't, I ain't cutting back on no names. If they call me, they know what it is. I'm going to tell the truth. But Tracy Barton was one of my partners and one of my, one of my following partners, man, uh, Clarence, uh, was Robertson. He was best dressed in 1987 when Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Clean cut. He's so pretty, so beautiful, he gonna get your woman. If he walk in the room, he got your girl, man. That's how beautiful this man is. You follow me? But he was a humble brother and he went to church every Sunday. Well, I left some money over his house and he got killed, so that's what happened with him. But this is how I got to smoking drugs, man. When I started smoking drugs, it was scary because I said I wasn't gonna do it. And then at that time, the cocaine was so powerful that people were having heart attacks. So that's scary. But my partner, I'd be cleaning my room up. I'm living there on 11th Street. And as I'm cleaning my room, they would come on my house because we ain't got no parents. I'm going to Roosevelt with me and my little brother, Vernon Williams. They call him Snooky or V. We had our own crib. So everybody in the hood over our house, right? And we having it our way. So they come over saying, man, what's up, man? I'm like, nothing, man. Chilling. I'm, I'm cleaning my room. Like, say, what's up, man? We finna mow the yard. Mow the yard? What is mowing the yard? That's pre-mowing. That's what they call it. So I'm like, man, I ain't mowing no yard, man. Like, oh, nigga, you scared. So now you're trying, but it's peer pressure. I don't know it. I say, bet, man, let's go. On. Let's, let's mow the yard then. But I always kept a little money, so I'll get to go to the ATM, 7 Eleven, right there on Illinois and Corinth. Get $10 out. That's how, that's how much a little stone costs $10. Get $10. We lace it up and I hit it. Oh, I'm feeling good. Now let's go. Let's mow the yard. Let, let's go. Let's keep it going. But now look at my bank account. I'm down to $10. I got to pay rent. I'm a bus boy. I'm working at Highland Park Cafeteria. I go out there, make my tears, pay my rent, do my thing. And then one day, another fallen soldier by the name of Basil. Now, Basil is a Muslim. I ain't know that, though. Basil come to school with the drips, right? What you doing? I'm selling crack. Then one day, I just got a job at Wacken Hut Security, 1988. Just graduated two years late from Roosevelt and did all of that work in one year. That's how I knew I was smart. Follow me? So he comes down in the in the GT, booming music, center lines, nine two eights. Cut, what's up? No shirt, Dookie rope, got money with the, the plated ring all the way across. What's up, man? I said, no, nah, man, I gotta go to work Monday. I said, man, come kick it with me, man. I go to the apartment and kick it with him. Blood everywhere. They didn't beat somebody up because they messed the money up. So I take over, I clean the place up, boom, 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 boom. Somebody knock on the door, he pull out a gun, put it in their face. Don't knock on the door. But we got the whole poem, it's New Jack City. So I'm following this same pattern. Make a long story short, we start, that's how my drug career began. Now I'm just gonna be here for the weekend and then I'm going to work Monday. And I'm mowing the yard. Now I got all, all the cocaine and everything. But when I get there, we got $4,000 worth of cocaine. 30 minutes later, it's gone. You follow me? So that's how much money I was making. And then it was, at that time, the Jamaicans were paying us $300 a week. 
But one of the drug addicts came up and says, uh, are those 20s? I said, yeah, them 20s. But they were $10 rocks. So every $10 he made, I made. I never worked again a day in my life. So now, and this is at the age of 10. Now, at 14. that time, I was about 19. Okay. At the age of 10, uh, I had to take you to the teenage year. At the age of 10, in Spanish Terry as well, you got a, uh, got a big homie named Willie Beard. Robert Dunbar, Daryl Dunbar, Richard Dunbar. These were big families, and they would be gambling. They'd be smoking weed. And, you know, like, really like the movies, for real. Huh, little nigga? So I smoke smoking in here, and I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just following them. But they 16, 17, I'm 9 and 10. It's 2, 3 in the morning. I'm still outside. I ain't going to school tomorrow. But I always knew how to add. I always knew how to read. You follow me? But I never cared about school because I ain't see no, what I'm going to go to school for? I go for lunch. I go get me a girlfriend. We get up early in the morning. At that time, they had uh, uh, breakfast, free lunch. We go in there, eat breakfast, and leave. So now you're 19, and you spoke about money became your God. Yes, Is this sir. around the time it became your God, around the age yes, of 19? Yes, Talk sir. about that experience of it becoming your God. Okay. Uh, okay, we know that, that God means force and power. And without force and power, you ain't nothing. There's a little sister named Tanya B., Right, she's from Old Cliff. She went to Roosevelt with me. Uh, Tanya B. Uh, she was a tomboy, and she hanged with us. She used to dance with us, pop lock with us, and everything. Right, so I'm at Keith's Bazaar. This old Bruce Bazaar. I'm at Keith's Bazaar. Right on Lancaster Keith. Used to be Treasure City back in the day. As I'm up there, and I'd have made this money, 19 years old. Now I got the the the, uh, the so-called boss man's money. I say so-called, right? And I got my money. I got his folk down, I got my folk down. And that was the thing. Every Sunday, everybody going to the Keith's Bazaar. So I got to go get me some ropes, right? I got to go get me some chains, right? And I'm putting chains around my neck like Eric Badu said. Follow me. I chained the chains, the shackles, and put on some gold chains. See, that's the mentality. We still slaves. But as I went up there, I pulled my money out. And Tanya B walks around the corner and said, Cut, what you doing? I said, I'm going to buy me some jewelry. She said, damn, man, you up. And me and her been together ever since. We were together prior to that. But I didn't even know what having money was. And then people started coming to me, the girls and the cheerleaders and the football players. They wouldn't speak to me when I was in school. Oh, now they want to be my girlfriend because I got that money. So now money became my God because if you didn't have money, I didn't even want you. When I reached my, my height or my zenith, I was making $100,000, $200,000 a day. If you ain't got no money, you ain't got $10,000, don't call my phone, don't say nothing to me. So anything that controls you becomes your God. You follow me? If you're controlled by sex, that's your God. If you're controlled by cars and things, then that's your God. If you're controlled by the spirit, the mindset, the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of God, then your God is called Allah. So this is what I mean when I say that money was my God. If it, if it didn't make money, it didn't make sense. If it didn't make dollars, it didn't make sense, like Bushwick Bill said. So I ain't trying to talk to you. If you ain't talking about no money, we ain't got nothing to talk about. So you will see me in the club and we kicking it. But when you come and you get ready to scope for me, it's 20, 30 guns there. My people's there. We ain't trying to hear nothing. Just give us this money and go on about your business. It's all about money. Nothing else. Um, you said a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars a day at what age? Uh twenty, about twenty-five. So at the age of twenty-five, making a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars a day, how, how did you manage that at such a young age? Uh, growing up, didn't go to college, mm -hmm. uh, didn't have no business school. Mm -hmm. So how was you able to handle at that age a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars a day? Growing up, how you did? Man, that's a good question too. Uh, first of all, it was all about loyalty and trust. Cause if you miss that money, it could cost you your life. So I learned when I was working for the Jamaican, I watch everything he do. I watch how early he get up. He like, cut, come on, come down. Your blood's clad wicked, man. You can't sleep all the time. So we get up early in the morning. Being the maximum, that was the thing back then, like a Mercedes Benz or Rolls Royce. And we would be driving. And he'll take me to the stash spot. And I see where he stashed it at. And he would take a kilo, a thousand grams, and he would cut it up. A kilo at that time cost, he probably was getting them for about 15. He was from New York. He's originally from Jamaica, but New York and then moved to Texas. And uh, at that time it was about that. And he would he would double cook it. That's what we call whipping. Right back then. So if you had a quarter key, he would make the quarter key a half a key. If you had one key, it would be two keys. Now, mind you, if you break that key down, if that's we're going to say $30,000 worth of drugs. Now it becomes 60000 just because of the way I cooked it. Right. 
So I'm watching him cutting, I'm watching him bagging, I'm watching his operation, and it stuck in my mind. Now, mind you, I started when I was seven or eight. The police would come by. And when the police would come by, they, in those days, they would have the little Dallas Cowboy cards. And all the children would run up to the car and they'd pass them out. See, they were trying to make us snitches. What's going on around here? What you talking about? But the big homie already trained us. Don't talk to the police. We don't like the police. You follow me? So the way I managed it is I watched other people that were having money and watched how they moved. There were brothers like Big Ken Jr. Uh, uh, they call his other brother. Uh, uh, I can't name it. His last name was Bell out of East Dallas. So every hood had somebody. You follow me? That was big in the drug game. Curtis Blow. You follow me? He's a preacher now. You follow me? Uh, Eli. So I'm watching all of these dudes, man. Eli's a preacher now too. But I'm watching how they move. And then I took that and I modified it and that's how I was moving. And I was using my pattern. You follow me? So I watch them in the club, how they move. I watch them in the streets, how they move. So every time I see them, I would just watch. And I was studying, but I didn't even know that I was preparing myself to become one of the biggest drug dealers that came through Dallas. And I'm not proud of it either. So that's how I learned to manage, just watching other people. So what, what principles would you take from that time mm -hmm. over to a legal business? Because oftentimes, you know, our young brothers and sisters, they are in that same lifestyle as well. And they looking at just the money part, but not looking at the consequences. Yes, sir. But I'm always thinking like, well, they can just, don't, don't just throw the whole life away. Look mm -hmm. at the principles of how you manage it Me and too. just do something legal. So now that you are on the other side, yes, what are some principles and things that you did learn from that situation that you would give to a young brother probably in the same situation? Okay, the first thing I would do is tell him be loyal, be trustworthy, don't trust everybody. A lot of us take that for granted, but the number one principle, rule, or regulation that he needs is he needs to stop right now. If you don't quit it, it's going to quit you, right? There's only two things that's going to happen. I got partners dead. That's like being in the Vietnam War, a veteran, and it's still affecting us to this day. You're going to die or get paralyzed or you're going to go to prison for the rest of your life. Point blank. So if I, if I were to tell you there was a guy by the name, he was my insurance man named Charles. Charles had an insurance company in South Dallas, and I just go get all my cars insured from him. I had 10 cars at one time. And Charles would tell me, Tony, he called me Cut Lip. Cut Lip, go outside and put a sign up right in front of my building. Take a picture of it and line those cars up and go get your auction license. That was his way of telling me, stop doing what you're doing, get this money, because these folks are going to get you. They're going to get you, it's just a matter of time. And every time I go to jail, Charles will be on my mind. So what I'm telling you now, the people that's listening, I'm going to be on their mind. Because I'm telling them if they don't stop, it's going to stop them. And you killing somebody's mother. You killing somebody's father. You killing somebody's daughter, somebody's child. You really murder. You're just a man selling parts. So I was looking at the news the other day. You got teenagers and people in elementary and junior high school and then somebody a little older than them taking advantage of them selling fentanyl pills. And it's killing them. That's the same as crack. And then you got to ask the question, who is manufacturing the crack? Who is manufacturing the pills? We don't make Uzis in Oak Cliff like the minister told us. So where are they coming from? In my day, we understood the drug cartel, the methylene cartel. You follow me? These different cartel, these different drugs, Pablo Escobar. And we started worshiping them. Who allowed them to make all that money? You follow me? What was their aim? What was their purpose? What was their motive? What was their intention for doing what they were doing? But see, what, we, what it is, brother Ben, we blinded by greed. See, when you blinded by greed, you can't see nothing else because now that, that it's a false worship. It's a false sense of, of pride, a, a false sense of I'm the man. Right. But when you get in that cell and get a life sentence, then you got plenty of time to think. When I got my federal time, I was one, two, three. I'm 25. Two, man, I'm about 27. Like one, two, three. Man, I'm going to be about 34 when I get out. Now you 27, 25. And you're going to be 34 when you get out. And then you got a family, you got children all over the place by different women. You got to think. You follow me? So that's the only way we're going to make it out of here, man. They got to really think. They got to really get their priorities right. And you got to take the, uh, uh, the time to get up out of that, transfer that money, transfer that energy from negative to positive. See? Was there ever a situation that was like a dangerous situation, a scary situation in your 20s mm -hmm. that caused you to think, man, shoot, I need to, I, man, let me go and quit doing this right here. Mm -hmm. But the money is so powerful, it's like a drug. 
See, I talk about back in that day, we call everybody a crackhead. Oh, man, it's a crackhead. And that's like disrespectful. You ain't nothing, right? But crackhead to save your life. A crack addict, the one that introduced me to the most unmiss in America. That's why I don't judge people. One of the instances, man, there was a guy that I used to chase, man, messing with these Jamaicans. And one of the, the lieutenants of the, of the captain, which was at that time called Mike. Mike was over everything. But he had a lieutenant. I forgot his name. I want to say David, Bob, or somebody. But I forgot his name. But he used to tell me, no, Peter, that was his name. Peter was from Jamaica. Mike brought him over here. And we're on the corner of, man, Illinois and Belknap. There was some apartments right on the corner. He had the whole apartment sold up. This guy had ran out with some money. So one day I find myself chasing him with a gun. As I'm chasing him with a gun, like, yeah, you better not come back around here no more. This same guy would come back. And me and him was in the apartment together. But Peter didn't like him. And I'm on Peter's side, right? But I'm ignorant, but God spared my life. One day he come there, but I'm not there because they had fired me. So I said, that's what made me start selling my own drugs after they fired me. And I come up there, just coming through, checking on, you know, my partners or whatever. And Peter got a bullet hole in his head by the guy that, he, that I was chasing. And the guy that I was chasing, I go up there and I'm looking over Peter's body with a hole in his head. Follow me? So the reason this happened is because you got young people not knowing what they're doing, and that scared the hell out of me, but it didn't scare me enough to stop me from doing it. You follow me? Uh, when you go to prison, you get scared. You follow me? And we say, oh, God, when we in prison, I ain't going to do it no more. I ain't going to do it no more. As soon as I got out the first day, I was selling drugs. First day. The crackhead who introduced you to the to the uh, to the teaching. This was before you went to prison, or or after. This was when I was in the holy facility in Mansfield, Texas. He was a drug addict. His name was JJ. We called him JJ. Jimmy Johnson. He was thirty six years old. Cut up. Eighth grade education. Started me to read. He introduced me to the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, Minister Fred Khan, and never said their name. Tactic and maneuver. I said, man, this man bad. I didn't know who the man was until a year later. After I reached El Reno, Oklahoma, in federal prison. How was he able to introduce without saying their name? What was his strategy? Oh, praise be the Lord. The first thing he says, uh, we were laying down my first night in jail. And he was walking around the cell. And he was quiet, just like it is now. And I, my bunk was there. Another bunk was there. Another bunk was about seven or eight of us in a cell. Lights coming in. You know, it's dark in the cell, but the lights coming in. And he was the oldest brother in there, and he walked around with his hands behind his back. He said, man, it's messed up how they doing us. So everybody stood up. Said, what you talking about, man? He said, they got us locked up like animals. He said, what you in here for? I said, I'm in here for drugs, selling drugs. He said, oh, you killing our people. I said, what you in here for, Pee Wee? Pee Wee said, I'm in here for, uh, for bank robbery. He said, that's good. You taking from the white man, right? So he started asking all of us. Then he says, uh, he got us excited. And then he says, have you ever heard of Dr. Francis Chris Wilson? I said, no, sir, who is that? He said, oh, man, you're going to love this. And I had money at the time. He said, man, I want you to go home and get a book. He said, did you go to uh, college? I went to one year of college. He said, you go to college? I said, yeah. So I graduated two years later. He said, can you read? I said, yeah, I can read. Follow him. I still couldn't read. I just learned how to read. Because reading ain't called uh, pronouncing words. Reading is understanding the grammar of the word that you pronounce it, okay? So when he said that, I said, man, this man crazy. He said, I got an eighth grade education. I went to eighth grade in school. He said, I'm going to give you 100 points, and I'm going to beat you in a game of Scrabble. That man gave me 100 points and slaughtered me, man. And the man was wise. But we, he never said... Jimmy X, all he just did, and then this is what this was the key, but I didn't learn it until I hit prison. He walked out of the cell. He said, okay, my mission is complete, and left. That's all he said, like a thief in the night. And then another uh, cousin of mine, he really a childhood friend, his name Kevin Williams. It's another Kevin Williams. He ran track for Roosevelt. He went to the military. He, he, was, uh, uh, he went to the Marines, the Marine Corps, right? And uh, me and him used to sleep on the floor together. His, his uh, auntie's name was Aunt Doris. And her and my mother were friends. We used to live with her. And we grew up now. Let's fast forward. 
I'm selling drugs. I'm at the height of my career. He living somewhere, I think, in Grand Prairie. I go over his house, and he got a book on the table, a green book. By, and this it's not a coincidence that these are psychiatrists by Dr. Naeem Akbar. And it was called, uh, what's the name? Visions for a Black Man. That was the first book I read at the age of 27. When I read that book, man, I thought I knew everything. I read two books, The ISIS Paper and Visions for a Black Man. And now as I'm thinking back, both of them were psychiatrists. And I was mentally ill, mentally dead. They woke me up, right? So all of these people played a part in it. So I started looking up words. I said, man, let me look up these words, man. So I started thinking, right, and being proud of that. I used to pray with a white man. His name was uh, John, and he had blue eyes, right? And we would all sit in a circle together. I got to tell you this story. And as we sit in the circle, I'm praying for the FBI, the CIA, the, uh, the DEA, the judge, his mama. Bless them all, Lord. But I'm in my ignorance. John goes to prison with me, too, and I see him. After I find out who the devil was, man, you don't get up, get up out of my face, man. And he was nasty. Okay, so now fast forward, I read these books. Now I start thinking about God. I said, so what does God mean? I'm saying this to myself. So I give me a sheet of paper. I write down God. I write down holy. I write down king, right? I write down uh, ghost. So I'm looking up these words, and I'm not knowing that I'm clearing words. I'm defining the words, and it gives me a better understanding. Right. So I thought I started looking at the word and I'm playing Scrabble. So I'm getting good with my word, my diction. And it's opening my mind up. As it's opening my mind up, I start seeing things different. I say, oh, man. Now, what made me think I knew everything, one of the brothers that was there with me, you had a brother from Cameron and you had another one from Zimbabwe. The one from Zimbabwe, he said, cut lip. Ever since you've been reading these books, you think you know everything now. <laughs> But that's how black men is when we don't know something, we get excited, right? So I started learning. And then one, another, the other brother from Cameroon, his name is uh, Daniel Dasaki. He's from Cameroon, from Cameroon, right? Daniel Dasaki began to teach us kickboxing, right? And how to protect ourselves. And then he's the one also that said, uh, there go Minister Farrakhan on TV. And I'm like, Farrakhan? It was the fruit of Islam because some children had got whooped in Dallas. And at that time, Brother Jeffrey was the minister. And I saw Brother Jeffrey come out of the jail with his suit and tie on, and the brother was around him, and they swept him off, right? And that was over uh, on Westmoreland when they whipped the children and sent them home for breaking into the bookstore, right? So these are the, this is how I came into the nation. This is how I began to read. This is how I began to study. That was part of my journey as I look back. And then I say, man, Allah is the greatest. Because he's, he's really, everything we're doing, even the brothers that's out there selling drugs, the youngsters that's selling drugs, that's killing and shooting, that's part of your journey. See, it's called a hive. You got to go through darkness to understand the light. You got to go through hell in order to understand heaven. You'll never understand it if you don't go through it. If you think you are holier than now, you'll never understand the, 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 the scripture said, those who are sick need not a physician. I mean, those who are well need not a physician, but those who are sick. So we got to come up out of the mosque. We got to come up out of the church. We got to hit the streets. Because everybody not well or think they well, but we all mentally ill. Praise be to Allah. What was your first direct introduction to the teaching? So you was introduced to Dr. Naeem Akbar's mm -hmm. sister, uh, Fran Francis Crest Wilson. Uh -huh. What was your first direct introduction that was at el reno oklahoma 1995 i got my ex september the 22nd 1995 that's the day that the most honorable elijah muhammad met master farah muhammad i thought that we were all muslims so they have a process that they take you through from mansfield which was a holding facility then we went to fort worth at that time some of the brothers went to fort, uh Siegelville. these were federal uh holding facilities and then they would ship you off to oklahoma city right when they shipped me to oklahoma city you ever see all the Muslims when it's time to pray? All the Muslims go in the room and start praying. There were hundreds of them. So I just thought all of us was Muslims, right? And then I saw, I started seeing things. These were my so-called Sunni brothers. I don't believe in the sex. I believe in, in the one God, and I believe that we are all one community, regardless of creed, class, or color. So as we prayed, I'm, and then the brothers, would, they'd go back to doing what they're doing after we get through praying, and we would be slamming the domino or whatever. And one of the Muslim brothers from, from uh, Arabia gave me my shahada. He said, put your finger up. He said, you took your shahada. I'm like, what is that? I'm like, nah. He said, put your finger up. I'll put my finger up. He said, repeat after me. Lay la hai la la shahadu ana Muhammad al Rasulullah. I say, lay la hai la la shahadu ana Muhammad al Rasulullah. There is no, I bet when is it there is no God and then Muhammad is his messenger. That's what I'm saying. And he looked at me 
He said, I wish I had that right there. I said, what are you talking about? He saw something in me that I ain't seeing myself. That was the desire, the sincerity, the good heart, like we all must have. And then we went back outside, and he says, uh, Aki. Aki is my brother in Arabic. Aki is just brother. Aki is with an I, but again, it's an E sound. My brother, go get my cigarettes. So I went upstairs to go get his cigarettes. But I'm saying to myself, man, something wrong, man. Cleaning this is God. Man. What they, they smoking that way? But I didn't know. I'm a baby in my seminal stage. So I gave him his cigarettes. Then I made it to El Reno. And I was like, Salam alaikum. They greet a certain way. One. He was like, Allah, 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 SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah. That's how the Sunni, so called Sunni brothers greet. All of us are Muslim. So I greeted one of the brothers in the nation like that. And he said, Brother, you might want to go over there with them. But I had looked at him. The brother was from California, Inglewood. And I looked at his shoes, they were shiny. And we were like the, the brown dicky suits in prison. And as we were in the brown dicky suits, they, they starched up, they clean. He had a bald fade. And I'm looking at him and I'm saying to myself, Yeah, that's me right there. That's me right there. So I was a so-called Sunni for uh, a week in prison. And then I, I mentioned to them about Farrakhan. They're like, oh, no, man, we don't, we don't follow Farrakhan. They practice shirt. I'm like, man, I ain't trying to hear that, man. I want that message to the black man. That's how I kicked out because I asked him about that because Jimmy Johnson, the one that was in the uh, federal holding facility, told me about that book. And that's how my journey started. And when I heard Minister Farrakhan one time, uh, that was it. I was all in. Um, I'm sure that there were brothers from that community that had a problem. Maybe once you mm -hmm. joined the Nation of Islam, mm -hmm. we often hear those debates. Yes, Tell me some of those stories. Man, we stay up debate all night, bro, man. When I got these teaching, bro, I knew all my lessons. Remind me of Brother Hawk. Shout out to Brother Hawk. Muhammad Mars, number 25. I was just like that, bro. When I heard him at 11 5, how you for I was like, oh, man, it made me, I started back studying my lessons. And we would drill you, man. We come up on you, bro. You better know your lessons, man. You don't know your lessons, we got a problem. You messing with bars, you messing with punks, you selling dope, man. We taking your lessons, bro. That's how I came in. Uh, captain Sharif was the captain. You follow me? And we didn't play, bro. We was in prison. We had a minister. We had a captain. We had lieutenants. We had squad leaders. It got so crazy, and so many people were writing the minister. He took all the positions and say, y'all just need a coordinator, and all I want y'all to do is study. Right? But some of the challenges that I had, one of the more scientific walked up on me one day. Follow up note with you, Ali. He said, what's up, son? I said, Negro, I ain't your damn son. He said, no, not S-U-N. I mean, not S-O-N, S-U-N. He was telling me that I was a light. But at the same time, he tried to pause me. He showed me a picture of Dodd Ford and said that, you know, Mass Fry, he sold, he sold, uh, he sold heroin. So those were some of the challenges I had. But I had a good brother by the name uh, uh, Lorenzo, Lorenzo X. He was from uh, Virginia, Frederick X. He from Bunton. And these brothers, was, every time I, they, somebody do something, they're like, slum legging, bro, check this out. Slum legging, bro. They'll give me something to, to wipe away that foolishness that they tried to poison me with. I went to the hole for a fight. When I went to the hole for a fight, I came out. I read a book by Alex Halen, Roots. When I read the book, I'm like, oh, man, they killed Malcolm, man. Oh, no, nah, I love Malcolm because I remember the movie, right? I, just, I knew about the ex, you know? I'm like, no, nah, man, they killed Malcolm. He said, brother, go listen to Minister Farrakhan, uh, Malcolm X, and uh, I think it's Minister Farrakhan 28 years later. When I got them facts in the, I said, oh, no. so I'm, I'm good. Every time somebody would do something, then I started studying the scriptures. So one day we came in, and I like to talk, right? And the, and the brother minister, he was a young brother named Brother Allen out of Compton, California, that trained me. He said, okay. But they, they plotted on me, right? It was a righteous plot. They had all the FOI to go in. We went into the chapel that day, and that was our Savior's Day. And they had all the trails lined across the stage. They said, go have a seat, brother. And Brother Lorenzo started bringing brothers up. These brothers are about to tell you what Islam has done for them. And Brother Fred went up. He fired up. Boom, boom, boom. And I had to go. I'm like, Lord, man, mercy, what am I going to say? And they up there, they in the back laugh, like, yeah, go on talk. You like to talk. So I, I go up, right? First thing that came to my mind was uh, Hosea 4, 5, and 6. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. They reject knowledge, and our God will reject thee. So I had about me three or four scriptures, and I started teaching. And this is my first time teaching. Everybody in there stood up and started hollering. I'm like, man, they're going crazy. And I just kept going. Genesis 15, 13, and 14. 
it talks about uh, uh, my people are strangers in the land that is not theirs, and they would say, I'm just giving it to them back to back. And they're like, go ahead, black man. So we fired up. I'm talking about the chaplain coming out, security coming. We fired up, and there's about two, 300 people in the chapel. And then, you know, we spoke a minute of peace. So that was some of the challenges now, the one-on-one -on -one challenges with the Christians, the one-on-one -on -one challenges with the historians and the Pan-Africans and the Moor Science Temples. I, I strategize. I don't even have to study for that, man, because I'll defeat you with the five percenters. You follow me? They, 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 you know, we got 154 questions and answers in our lessons that we are taught by the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Mother Tanera. So you got a brother by the name of Clarence 13X, right? They call him Allah. He took 120 degrees of the lessons. He left 34, which is the problem book. You follow me? So you can't say that you got a piece of the pie and didn't get the whole pie. You can't give credit, right, to someone and you don't give credit to the tree that we came from, the fruit of Islam, Master Farah Muhammad. So those are my challenges that I had, and I just studied the minister. I had a, a stronger desire to learn, and when I was in prison, I said, this ain't a, a prison, this is a university for me. So that's what I was doing. I was just studying. You know, a lot of people in there gamble and do their thing and mess with boys. And I'm talking about lift weights, looking good. So I'm warning all the sisters. Everybody that's in Crosby, and not everybody, but it's some of them. They do that. And they'll go right into the visiting room. I saw Chris Blood, all of them do it. And go right into the visiting room, kiss a woman, and come back and be in late with a man. I saw the hooper. They can hoop slamming. I'm talking about Michael Jordan. And you go in the day room, you see him with a man. I've seen this with my own eye, but I'm not gonna post salt on nobody because their name is not important. But we don't judge the person by, by his past. We judge him from the time that he come into the nation. Now your slate is wiped clean. Now what are you gonna do? Cause when you know better, you'll do better. Praise be the Lord. You spoke about the Wallace Dodd mm -hmm. picture. Of course, many new people coming into the nation of Islam, yes, those who, they we, we get that same response. Oh, yes, look at this picture, yes, look sir. at this file, look at this article. Mm -hmm. So for somebody coming in, and you've already probably done dealt with that several times in prison. How would you, what would you tell a brother who gets a, a post or a DM, hey man, I see you interested in the nation, check this picture out. Okay. The best thing I can tell you, man, number one, you got a brother on the executive council. He already did the homework for you. His name, he got two names, right? He, one of his names is True Islam. His other name is Dr. Wesley Muhammad. This is the only man I was reading books for 20 years. I ain't never had a problem with understanding the word. Dr. Wesley got words in his books that you got to, he got to tell you where they come from. This man is super studious, man. I'm talking about super studious, bro. Got most of all of his books. And he'll clear all that mess up in the twinkling of an eye. But you got to want to know the truth. Because one thing I learned from Mr. to the Black Man, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, it says that some people want to misunderstand on purpose. They want to knock us off our square, right? They'll do this. They're like, watch this, watch this, watch this. Bro, Ben, man, y'all talking about Master Farah Muhammad is a lie. How is he a lie? And he was born February 26, 1877. And the sun, moon, and star was here before him. See, these are questions I ask myself, right? But what makes him a lie is that a lie is a title. Learn this from Dr. Wesley. A lie is a title that a man comes up under like a president is a title that a man comes up under. And he's able to fulfill that title. You follow me? So it's easy to prove that Allah is a man. You can read the first chapter in the Holy Quran called Al-Fatiha or the opening. It'll say, in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. That's in the, of the opening. Just the, the, that little Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the, T-H-E. And if you keep reading in the body, then it says, Iyakana Abuduwai, Iyakana Sta'in. The, with two E's, circle that, old English. Only you do we worship. You is a pronoun referring to who? A man. Now you got to find a man that fits that description that's waking everybody up, and that's called the resurrection. And you, if you look at the history of the nation of Islam, Malcolm X was a drug addict. He was on dope. Brother Tony sold dope. And I was a drug addict. And I was a womanizer. And I got children all over the damn planet. Excuse my French. Right? Now, if I can make a phone call right now and go get many as drugs as I want to and backslide, and I don't do it, then who is that man that's stopping me from doing that? Minister Farrakhan, in person. But who do you say he is? Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're an angel. Who do you say he is? You can tell a man by what? His works. And you can tell a tree by the fruit that he bears. And I'm some fruit, and I know I'm good fruit because now I'm married. I'm a, I'm a grandfather. I got my own business. You follow me? Elijah's produce. huh? I got my own trucking company. I don't get up and report to no white man. 
You follow me? And I'm not saying that derogatory, but I'm just letting us know we slaves. I got a cousin that calls people boss, and you got a PhD. No, you the boss. This is how we think. This is what Minister Farrakhan is putting in us. He said, y'all can't kill me because I'm everywhere. He's in us. So this is what I would advise the youngsters or anybody that's searching for knowledge. Seek refuge in Allah. Don't seek refuge in your, your brother captain, your brother minister. Nobody. Seek refuge in Allah. Minister Farrakhan teaches us, don't even worship me. You better get connected with the one I'm connected with. And that's Allah God in the person of Master Farrakhan. Go ahead. Yes, sir. You spoke about having that love for Malcolm. Yes, sir. Now that he's gone, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And they lift him up so that they can drop a lug on him and say, Oh, it was the minister, oh, it was the nation that brought it down. How did you get over that hump? Because you start off, you know, loving all. Not that you still, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Listening to Minister Farrakhan, Minister Farrakhan, when I heard on the video, he said, Spike Lee should have came to me if you want to know about Malcolm. Don't nobody know Malcolm better than me. I was there. You follow me? He said, Malcolm was the type of man that when he, he ate one meal a day, he was very disciplined, right? When he had a meeting, he would be there five minutes early, right? Say he was a studious man. He was a praying man. You can't say you know Malcolm and you don't know how to pray. You can't say you, you know Malcolm and you're not eating one meal a day. Malcolm would walk up to you and, and say, look at it. Uh, he said, brother, you got some food in your teeth and walk off. See, signs and symbols are for the conscious minds. You follow me? A hint is sufficient for the wise. So we got to know what's going on and how it's going on. But we love Malcolm because that's what Hollywood gave us, right? And we all, all of us going to love black power. When I was in prison, I used to always say, I'm going to call the NAACP, not knowing that that's a Jewish organization. What I'm going to call them for, and the Jews set up the organization called the NAACP to help black folks. No, to control black folks. I'm going to give you this money, I'm going to give you this suit, I'm going to give you this chicken, I'm going to give you this watermelon, and this is what I want you to tell them. That's what we do. So that's how I got over the hump. It's just by study. You got to study. You got to research. A lot of people don't know that Malcolm X's father was in the UNIA, uh, uh, United Negro Improvement Association, uh, following Marcus Garvey. You follow me? They don't know how Malcolm grew up. They don't know that before the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad reached Malcolm, Malcolm was in a hole. His name was Red, but he called himself the devil. Until he got a letter from his brother, Philbert. And Philbert was telling him about a man by the name of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad with a fourth grade education. Now, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word became flesh. So when we hear the word, where is the flesh at? It's you. It's me. It causes us to change with the inside. So we are taught by Farrakhan. Farrakhan, Farrakhan. That blood goes from your head to your heel, back to your head, 8 minutes and 20 seconds. At the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second. And if you multiply 186 times 500, you'll get 93 million. That's where the sun is, causing the earth to rotate on its axis at 1,037, one third miles per hour. This is what Farrakhan is teaching us. So back to Master Farah Muhammad, you will know that he's God. Why? Because it says in the scripture that one would come and give the measurements of the earth. Who is that one that did that? Then you will know who Elijah is. How are you going to know who Elijah is? Moses in Exodus 33, 11 said, Moses spoke face to face with God as a man speaking with his friend. Ain't no man in the annals of history have ever said that they spoke face to face with God outside of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. Right? But we're looking at it historically instead of looking at it prophetically, which is to come. That's what the scriptures are. Prophecy. It means it's going to come. It ain't happened yet. Praise be to Allah. Yes, sir. Um... Now, oh, well, let me ask this. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of brothers and sisters who, they live in this lifestyle, and they're going to see this and say, well, I don't care about going to prison. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm living like that, as they say. But a lot of them don't know the conditions of Ooh, prison they've teacher. never been in. Good teacher. So, so, you know, it's like you ain't going to touch the stove because you know it's hot. Come on now. Until you touch Come it. Come on. So talk about some of the stories and what you've seen since you've been in prison to warn them what they think they're signing up for. Hmm. I'm going to start that out like this. That's a real good question. I'm going to start it out with Dr. Khalid. He was a minister and a supreme captain in the nation of Islam, an international representative. He went to prison. He told you about his prison experience. When you go to prison, they're going to tell you, open your mouth. Stick your tongue out. If you got her and you like your hair, don't go to prison because they're going to cut it all off. You'll be looking like me, bald-headed. If you got dreads, they're going to cut it off. They don't care. 
This is in the state prison. I've been to state prison and federal prison. Then they humiliate you. This, I'm talking about you can go to the county jail, Lou Steris. They're going to humiliate you. You're going to go through this process, just like it's an auction block of slavery, right? Then they tell you, I'm not being facetious or being funny, but I'm going to tell you exactly like it is. They're going to tell you to raise your testicles. They're going to tell you, turn around, put your hands in, on your backside and open your backside and look in it and make sure ain't nothing in it. And when everybody does that, you can start, you start smelling defecation right off the top. It's disgusting. Then they tell you to go in there and take a shower. And I was 17 when I first went to jail. When I first went in there, I was walking with my shoes off because it's like we at home. We think we at home. And the, and the old man was sitting there. He said, man, you're going to go in there and kill them babies? I said, what babies? They end up masturbating all over the floor. They're going to feed you bologna. They're going to feed you pork. They're going to put in your drink soft Peter. And one time, I forgot what, it was a, 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 a chemical that they were putting off in the meat and people were growing tumors on themselves. If your teeth ain't healthy, guess what? Ain't no dental care in there. You got riots. You got fighting. If you want peace and quiet, don't go to prison. I have been with men that can't even read and write and say, man, can you write my girl a letter? I have written letters for men, grown men. See, you got a man that's 75. You got a man that's 55. You got a man that's 60, but he's not a man, right? He's a male. A man is a man that submits his will to do the will of God. God has to be the center of his life or we're not a man. We don't know what love is unless God is the center of our life. You can't take God out of the equation. He's the creator of you and I. He knows best for us, right? But back to the prison, right? I have saw men, and, I, and I'm one of them. I lost my mother while I was in prison and couldn't go to a funeral. So what if your child get killed? What you going to do? You can't go to the funeral. They don't care how much money you got. You ain't nothing but a number. My number was in, in uh, 1989, 5195, 60. My federal prison number was 81, I mean, excuse me, 187, 35, 29. See, you begin to remember those numbers, but those numbers are scars, man. They don't even refer to you as a man. You follow me? They use you like a piece of meat. They work you for free. They got a place in there called Unicor, United Nations Incorporated. It's a warehouse inside of the prison. You remember the price is right, and you spin the wheel. Uh, what's his name? Bob Parker. Oh, that's where they're spending their money. The congressmen and the senators, they invest in the prisons and they pay you a dollar and some an hour. You follow me? This stuff that we don't know. Then you, you go to the visiting room. If you're not married, you can't touch her. You won't even have a physical visit. Huh? Then you got men raped. I just saw men get raped. Right? They got protection in there now. But men were getting raped. I have been in the room with a man that killed his mother. I mean, excuse me, his grandfather and his grandmother got a life sentence, and he's a midget. You understand what I'm saying? See, it's, it's, it's horrible, man. It's the worst story you ever want to hear, but it's just like slavery. They work you from can't see morning to can't see night. You get up in the morning before the sun comes up, you go out, and when you hit them fields, it's going to be daylight. You might walk in the mud and horse manure and I don't know what for three, four miles, five miles. When you get there, they'll have you in the horse stalls in the manure, walking, hitting on it. You ain't no grass. You're just hitting the grass. Follow me? Then after you do that, they'll walk you all the way back. And when you hit that back gate and you go in to eat, you got to get butt naked again. Every time you go out of the building, you got to get butt naked. You're humiliated. And it might be a 20-year-old sister that's looking at you. You feel me? So it's sickening. And our people are sick. And the whole system is sick. And we need to put them out of business. And the only way we're going to put them out of business is submit our will to do the will of a, of a lot, to have a new heaven and a new earth, starting with a new self, self-improvement, the basis for community development. We know from the teachings that the food the Honorable Elijah Muhammad mm -hmm. said is what actually kills us. Yes, sir. It's not necessarily a timeline set time for us to die. Yes, sir. We have the book How to Eat to Live. Yes, sir. Talk about because there's some brothers may say, Well, I can fight. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm swole, I can go in there. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean don't that somebody can't fight better or bigger than you. That's right. But we'll get to that. But I want to touch on the, the the eating part. You know, how is the eating in there if you if you are Muslim? Do they allow you to just eat fruits and vegetables or do they do they slip in pork here and there and they're not supposed to talk about the eating and the food in there? All of that. I, I, they slipped some pork on me when I first became a Muslim. And I was so hungry, I thought it was, it was that other white meat. I started getting dizzy. Then you got the pork byproducts. You got the jello. You have the uh, marshmallows. You got the pork byproduct names. That's why you got to study. Even the bread got pork in it. And we were talking when we were in prison. We were arguing, man, the Doritos got pork in them. 
And I'd be like, man, get on with all that foolishness, man. I'm too hungry for this, man. And the brother would say, uh, Brother Allen, may Allah uh, uh, bless him, man, because that's a good brother. Help me get where I am, young brother. And he said, you say, Brother Tony, when you in doubt, do it out. If you doubt or you think it's support, get out, don't eat it. David, you, the vegetables you're going to eat are canned vegetables. I, I mean, I was in there, the federal prison, the food is better. The state, if you ain't got no money, you out of there, man. Straight, you got to work in the kitchen. Brothers want to work in the kitchen where the food is so you can have somewhat some control of what you're going to eat. The best thing you're going to eat in there is chicken and fish, and it's fried and some of it's baked. The best vegetable you're going to eat, you might eat some fruit, some, some pearls out of the can. Man, I eat some rice, but it's white rice. You can't, you can't cook it right. You follow me? And I, and I go in there and ask. We call them bosses, but I never call them bosses. I call them COs because boss is a slave mentality. Yes, sir, boss. No, sir, boss. No, nah, that's slave mentality. Excuse me, CO, such and such and such and such. Would you be so kind? Can I get some of that sugar? She'll look around. Go on over there and get some of that sugar, boy. And I'll get some sugar and I'll go give me some butter and some rice. And I was working in the kitchen. And they trusted me. I was loyal. I didn't steal. I asked for what I want. You follow me? And on my birthday, they, they wrote me up a case. They said, you stealing. I didn't think it was stealing. I'm in survival mode. It's my birthday, June the 19th. Right? I'm going to give me some of this good fried chicken. I'm going back to my cell and I'm going to make me a spread. A spread is we take a, they just take a, a bucket, an empty bucket, and put some Roman noodles in there. And all the homies, if you my homie, you from Dallas, or wherever you from, you ain't got nothing to eat, we're going to get two, three soups. We're going to get a, uh, some sloppy joe. We're going to pour it in there. We're going to boil it out the can, cut it open, and pour it in there. We're going to put us some... Uh, uh, some Fritos off in there. We're going to put us some squeeze cheese in there. Uh, we spray it, man, and it's going to swell up. And then we're going to get us some tortillas. We're going to wrap them tortillas up like we wrap weed up. Uh, there you go, there you go, there you go, there you go. And everybody going to eat, everybody going to get full, man. We were family up in there because we're in survival mode. You follow me? And that's how we survive, man. But that food is ridiculous, man. It ain't nothing you want to do, bro. Now, you, this is how I look at it. You got brothers in there. Yeah, man, I used to have, I used to have. They showing pictures, right? Thinking there, man, you ain't never had no house keys, man. You don't even know how to buy a house. What are the requirements to buy a house? What is your FICO score? You probably, but you a man. You ain't got your own keys. I ain't talking about what your girlfriend got. I ain't talking about what your mama got, your sister and your family got. I'm talking about what you got as a man. You follow me? So that's why I thank Almighty God Allah uh, for the teachings of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Let's talk about Minister Louis Farrakhan. But though the food is ridiculous. I don't care how much money you got, you'll never be satisfied. You talked about not not lying, uh, mm -hmm. being trustworthy, mm -hmm. even in prison. Right. W was that helpful, even in that environment, or it, it, it didn't really matter? It, it, it was helpful. Because you got some devils, and you got some disbelievers, you got Satan, you got Shaitan. Satan is one whose evil is confined to himself. Shaitan is one whose evil of, of not only affects him, but it affects others. A murderer is a Shaitan. Because now I done murdered somebody, now it's going to affect their children, their mothers, the whole family. Satan, I might just be shooting up myself, right? It ain't hurting nobody because don't nobody know this is me that I'm destroying myself, right? So when we understand the mindsets and we come into the mind of the most high, then we can get some control over that. You with me? Uh, Ask me another part of that question. My, my, my thoughts moving fast. I, I was talking about how you talked about you was trustworthy. Gotcha. And, and th that that helped you even in the prison yeah. environment. Yeah, this, this is how it helped you. Man, the, the teachers are so beautiful, man. Allah is always going to send you an angel. I'm talking about a man or a woman. And they're going to see something in you and say, you ain't like nobody else. Go in there and get you some new socks because I was working in the laundry. Go in there and get you some new, some new such stuff because everybody, you got to buy that stuff. And the stuff that you were dirty that they issue you. You follow me? So that, those are angels. You will see a brother. I'll be on the line. And then I see you come through the door. i like, oh, there go my brother, Brother Ben. Right? So I'm going to give you an extra piece of chicken. I'm going to give you an extra piece of fish. So they see the trustworthy. They see the loyalty. They see the bond. You might be walking on the regular with a brother that's having a problem with his family. Don't know what to say. Don't know what to do. You write him a letter. You do something for him. You, you shoot him some coffee or something. So that's how you, you build bonds. Now, you got guards that just don't like you. There was a guard. I used to have my prayer rug out, everything clean. I never did nothing. I was obedient. I never got in trouble. And I would tell him, same man, so, so. he just didn't like me. But another brother liked me. I named the brother Salat, right? And he was in prison, but he was a Sunni. I just sat down and started talking to him one day. He became my brother. He, he, he left that community and came into the nation of Islam. And him and that guard that I was having a problem with, 
he said, who are you? So he went to him. See, when you can't handle the problem, you always see somebody else that can. He went to him and said, say, man, you see him? He was talking to him. He said, do you see that little brother right there? He said, man, that's my big brother, man. Leave him alone, man. That right there, he right, man. If you want to mess with somebody, mess with these one right there gambling and selling drugs. Leave him alone, man. He right. So God going to always send you an angel or somebody that's going to protect you. Somebody that's going to fight for you. Somebody that's going to kill for you. I had Bloods and Crips my first night in jail. Bloods and Crips came to my cell and did not leave. For two days, my first day in jail, August the 1st, 2013, I was teaching Bloods and Crips for two days straight. I had to put him out on the teaching of the Muslim Elijah Muhammad so I can get me some sleep. How many years did you serve in prison? And when you got out, what was your process of getting on your feet? Oh, praise be to Allah. I did 19 years off and on. The last trip, I did five years or four years and eight months. In the process, it wasn't drugs, but I took that same mentality, that hustle mentality and that, that, that ingenuity. I, I thought like this. I want to make all the money. I want to have all the women. I want the best cause, right? So I took that same energy that was negative and I made it positive. I'd stay up all night selling drugs, cooking drugs. So I need to stay up all night studying. I need to stay up all night praying. I need to stay up all night learning my dawn, learning business. You follow me? I was preparing myself when I was in prison. So when I got out, it was a smooth transition. Before I left, uh, when I caught that, that, that drug case, I had a cleaners called uh, Cut Price Cleaners on Cedar Crest and Bonneview in Oak Cliff. That's where I caught the drug case at. See, I was trying to straddle both sides of the fence. You got to love one and hate the other. So when I left, then, now after I caught the case, I fought it for three years. In the process, I bought my 18-wheelers. Then I put them up. See, I'm always plotting. I'm always planning. I'm always strategizing. I got the cleaners when I was selling drugs because Elijah came on my mind. Elijah said, you better clean this up. I prayed to Allah to help me in the drug game. I said, Allah, I need 100000 Please help me. I got 100000 so fast it was pitiful. I believe in God. See, we don't know the power of God unless we try it. So we, we, you know, Allah tries us, but we don't try him. So when you try Allah and you sincerely love Allah, can't nobody defeat you, man. They might not like you, you follow me, but that's part of the game. They hated Jesus, like my mom used to say. They hated Martin Luther King. Sticks and stones may break my bone, but words will never hurt. So my process was this. Proper preparation prevents poor performance. I learned that from Elijah. So I'm always one step ahead of you, two steps ahead of you. So I, I drive trucks. I sell AirPods. I sell computers. I'm going to keep me a hustle. My daughter just put me on that today. So y'all get at me as soon as you can. Pray be the law. Then I got Elijah's Produce. There's a brother named Kenneth 6X out of Chicago. There's another brother named Matthew X. Uh, he, out, he out of uh, Oak Cliff. He was in Muhammad Mile number 48. Then he transferred to 52. They taught me how to move in the nation. How to move with the final call. Brother Hashim Hakim. He taught me how to move with the final call. Then I, I put the fruit with it. Right? Then I came up with a name, Elijah's Produce, me and one of my brother's brother, Bernard X. Right? We used to be out in front of the mosque. But before I got in front of the mosque, it used to be all over the city. And it wasn't moving the way I wanted to. But I wanted that fruit to move like I used to move that crack. You follow me? And, and then I prayed to Allah. And then Brother Amir, uh, student first in Dallas, Texas, he said, Brother Tony, my daddy used to, Captain Shah, shout out to Captain Shah, right? He said he used to go in front of the mosque. Soon as I went out in front of the mall, somebody stopped one of my nephews and said, what's up, aunt? And gave me $5, right? Then I was going to get a load because I'm a truck driver, original Supreme Express, LLC. Got my CDL. So and I'm going to get the load, I go to a watermelon spot. But they got the seedless watermelon. But I need them seeded because I know we don't eat the seedless. And when I went in there, I say, man, look at uh, what the watermelon hit for? Oh, we can give them to you for such and such and such and such. I said, okay. I said, I'll be back. I'm going to get my pickup truck. I'll pull up. Give me, a, give, me a, give me a credit of them things, man. As soon as I hit the block, with my, I got me some bean pies from Sister Earth, right? Then that's a, a veteran on the bean pie, number one bean pie. Then I got that. Then I got me some Kool-Aid pickles, right? Just hustling. Then I, I titled my, my, uh, my, uh, my movement Straight Drop, lining my mind up with God, doing righteousness on purpose, right? Then I got my fruit bag that Brother Kenneth showed me how to do. And he, they were selling $2 and $3 fruit bag. That's how we bought that Mars. I started doing the $5 fruit bag, the $7 fruit bag, and the $10, $15, $20, $25 watermelon. And it just came together just like traffic. Praise be the Lord. So that's, 
that's an inspiring story because when you talk about the watermelons, I've gotten several watermelons. Yes, you done blessed me with several yes, watermelons. Yes, sir. It's almost like you took that same principle mm -hmm. from the street life yes, sir. And, and brought it into, exactly. uh, you know, righteous. That's so right. what you say, basically, a brother living that lifestyle just needs to find him a product. Mm -hmm. That's it. Because this is what we do. This is what I was taught. I, I used to study entrepreneurship in prison. And I try to stay ready to keep from getting ready. So as I was studying it, I'm like, man, you get used to living a certain lifestyle. I'm used to, you know, three-bedroom house, brick house, nice, beans. That's what I'm used to. But now you got to learn how to humble yourself. You got to learn how to be broke. So how do you learn how to be broke? Learning how to be broke is not saying necessarily I don't have no money. Learning how to be broke is saying that I'm going to make it regardless of the circumstances, but the way that I'm going to make it is going to be a righteous concept. It's going to be rooted in righteousness. You follow me? So I take a negative and make it a positive, right? Dog spelled backwards is God. That's negative, dog. I'm going to turn it around. I'm going to become a God. I'm gonna, I want to be in my higher self. I want to be in control of myself. So what I did, I say, man, what am I going to do? Because people used to see him kind of clean. They used to see him in a nice car. But I had to ride a hoopty. You hear me? I had to humble myself. And then when I humbled myself, that, that spirit, that mentality was in me. And my cousin and, them, and my family, they always believe in They say, man, I know you. He finna get some money. Y'all got him messed up. He gonna get some money one way or another. See, you gotta have a mentality, man. I ain't gonna let nothing, no obstacle get in my way. I'm gonna meet and overcome all obstacles in my path. Regardless of the circumstances, I'm gonna make it happen. How you gonna make it happen? Because I believe in God. He and he alone. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And he that is in me is a mentality that don't quit. He's a warrior. You follow me? So that's the mentality that I take. When I wanted to learn my prayer, because the, the Sunni brother won't let you pray with them if you don't know. Oh, you don't know Arabic. Get over there. That's what made me want to learn the Arabic. Because you telling me what I can't do. When you tell me I can't do something, you ain't going to do nothing but upset me. Right? And when I get upset, then I go to work. Mm. Talk about as we start to close because you was in prison so long yes, and sir. you talked about having to learn how to be broke yes sir talk about patience Ooh, man. uh how did you develop patience because the minister said we are not born mm -hmm. with patience mm -hmm. so how did you develop patience over the over time and what guidance would you give someone who's striving to get off their feet and they in in the major ingredient is patience for them to get to that success uh, the minister said minister farrakhan in the study guides, it talks about the will. How strong is your will? How strong is your foundation? Patience is long suffering. Patience is love, right? Have you ever been in love with somebody so much that they can do anything and you just tolerate it? See, that's long suffering. See, some of us are married with wives, for those of you who ain't, when you get your wife, I'm gonna give you a tip. She gonna make you more upset than anybody on the planet. Why you didn't do this? Why you didn't do that? You follow me? Take the trash out. Do this. I need you to pay all the bills. So patience, to me, is equivalent to love, right? Love is one of the 99 attributes of Almighty God Allah, right? So when you are willing to suffer and be patient with something, sometimes the minister, I think I heard the minister say this, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm right. And I'm, it's, it's verbatim, a paraphrase. The minister said one time that he was looking, uh, he was getting ready to get on an airplane. He was getting ready to go somewhere, and he missed his plane. And he was so upset. But something happened on that plane. I don't know if it crashed or whatever, but the plane went down, right? And he could have been on that plane. So you, if you understand patience and understand how God works, Allah works, then you can say, look what I missed. See, a truck driver got to have patience. He was a traffic jam. On my way here, it was a traffic jam. So I got to have patience. I got to maneuver. I might have to go another way, and the other way might take me longer to get here. So as a truck driver, you're impatient because, you, man, I'm trying to get home. I'm trying to get to my class. I want to be in my family. I'm trying to watch the game. But a truck driver might take them four hours to, to get your load off. That's patience. Go to prison, you're going to have patience because you can't get out. So what you going to do? And you want to get out. So you learn the skills of patience. Pa being patient is a mindset. Being patient is a skill that one has to develop over time, and you'll never master it. But you can get in control of it and understand it. And I think that's the part of mastering patience is when you understand what patience is. Now, I often have heard you along this interview, mm -hmm. people call you Cut Lip. How did you get that name? Oh, praise be to Allah. Man, uh, I was born in Denison, Texas, 325 East Day Street. 
325, you got the three and the two. That's five. Five and five, if you go in the Holy Quran, it's called the beneficent, right? God is good, always good. He was good before we was even born. As a child, my lip wasn't like this. But my mother was down the street, negligence. My brother's father was in the bed, drunk, sleep. I can remember it as I'm talking to you. And the bed was right here. Back then, they called them component sets or stereo systems, and it had a black and white TV on top. And I was out of the bed. I don't know how I got out of the bed because the bed was this high. I wasn't even walking yet, and I crawled. And I went behind this, the component set or the stereo. And when I went behind there, it was dark, but you know how you can see the TV light. And when I went behind her, I beat a wire, an electrical cord. And that electrical cord electrocuted me, and it burnt my lip. And my mother told me when I, when, when I was a child that I had stitches in surgery, and I couldn't even eat, and they had stitched me up all the way to here, right? But God blessed me. So I look at that as a blessing. I was electrocuted as a child due to negligence and somebody not watching me. Wow. And uh, oh, the last part, a friend of mine named Cedric Kenner, so they gave me that name out of mockery, cut lip. So I never, it, it was hard for them to put that on me. By nine to 10, I started dancing, then I started accepting it. And then I came into the nation of Islam. When I came into the nation of Islam, it says the use of nicknames are prohibited. I didn't like nobody calling me cut lip. I don't care who you is, you finna, we just finna get a fight out of me. But then they started calling me Tony X and respecting me. And some of my homies, they'll say cut lip. I don't even get upset because I've grown and matured with patience, with long suffering, with love. And I understand. So you can call me cut lip. I know what you're talking about. That means you know me. Or you can call me Tony X. I know what you're talking about. I know you love me. But I got my Muhammad now, so I'm Tony Muhammad. All praise be to Allah. Praise be to Allah. As we close with that question that you was asked, what has Islam done for you? Oh, praise be to Allah. Islam has done everything for me, man. Islam has gave me a mindset of peace. See, you can have money, cars, houses, women, all of that. If you ain't got peace, you ain't got nothing. It gave me peace. It gave me sanity. It gave me reason. It gives, it gives me purpose. Like you, like you got on, she gives me purpose, man. It makes me feel good. The best feeling I ever had, I thought, was when I made my first $100,000. But the best feeling I had, knowing the truth of the Most High Elijah Muhammad, is when I fell back in love with my mother. Is when the people in Katrina had flooded and they came down here. And me and a couple of my family members, me, my wife, uh, uh, my cousin, Lil Jane, I was telling you about my wife, Sister Diane X, uh, who else was with us? It was, oh, and his girlfriend at the time, Tamika, or Mika. We all got some clothes. We all went to uh, Brown's Chicken and bought 100 boxes of chicken and fed the people. That was the best feeling I ever had. Best feeling I ever had. So that's what Islam has done for me. It taught me how to be a man. And you'll never be a man if God ain't in your life. If God ain't in your life, you're not a man. And the way that God gets in your life, he gets in your mind. Praise be to Allah. And if you can close uh, by looking at the camera, tell us what your name is, uh, what mosque you're a part of, and if somebody wants to contact you, how could they contact you? Yes, sir. My name is Brother Tony Muhammad. Praise be to Allah. I'm a part of Muhammad Mosque number 48, where Brother Al Shaheed is the minister. Praise be to Allah. Appointed by the most honorable minister, Louis Farrakhan. You can reach me at 469-473-6201. All praises be to Allah. And may Allah continue to bless you and your family with the light of understanding. I'd like to thank Brother BNX for allowing me this opportunity. I'd like to thank all my regional laborers, Dr. Halim, uh, Brother Stephen, Sister Malika, all praise be to Allah, the local laborers, and most of all, the executive council. Last but not least, my big brother, your big brother, our big brother, the most honorable minister, Louis Farrakhan, the man that I'm madly in love with. All praise be to Allah. Salam alaikum. One more. I forgot to ask. Go ahead, brother. You, I don't know We you called me mm -hmm. or you told me. Yes, sir. The first time you heard about me in prison. T talk, talk about that. I forgot to ask that. So. Yes, sir, bro. I was... Uh, I read the Final Call avidly. I learned a lot of stuff out of the Final Call newspaper. This is the newspaper that the most honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, he put his house up to start this, this newspaper in order to get black folks information. I don't think we understand how valuable he is, right? Say one more thing about the minister, then I'm going to get to Brother BNX. 
the minister was offered, I just learned this a couple of days ago, he was offered the portfolio of Michael Jackson, which is equivalent to $500 million or a billion dollars. And he told him, no, brother, I don't want that. That's the type of man you're dealing with that's teaching us morals, that's teaching us values. You follow what I'm saying? I also thank Brother Malik, bro, for, for going to the college and getting you. You follow me? And putting that word in you. But I, I learned about Brother Ben. I was in prison. He had your little brown suit on, that chocolate, pray be the law. And I was reading the article. I say, man, this brother here is cracking atoms. You follow me? See, when you love the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, you don't have any envy or any jealousy in you. You don't want to stop your brother. You want to motivate your brother. Let me know. I got a little brother like Brother Ben, man. I ain't worried about nothing because I know he's going to keep pushing. I know he's going to push these teachers. I know he loves Minister Louis Farrakhan. So if you mess with him, you're going to have to mess with me. You follow me? But I pray and I hope that you understand what my little brother is doing. So the way I met Brother Ben, as I began to study him, he ain't talking about it, he being about it. Like you say, used to be you don't make honey. Huh? You got to get this honey, man. And you got to make this honey and bring it back to the honeycomb. But we thank Allah for all of our pioneers, all of the ones that came before us, all the ones that are still working. You follow me? I never, 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 never be able to thank Allah enough for my little brother and for the teachers of the most honorable life mama. It's taught by Minister Farrakhan. But this is how I met you through a newspaper article. And I was just reading. And I'm like, man. And then what really made me feel good, he from Oak Cliff. That's my hood. Put it in their face, get this stuff understood. So when I saw my brother, I was like, man, this on, man. And then I found out he can hoop. You follow me? He got them handles. You know what I'm saying? Shooting the three pointers. And he sacrificed everything he loved. Sacrifice everything he loved. I mean, when he was in the Houthi, now he driving vets, huh? So that showed you the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, man. You can't stop, brother, man. You can take everything today. We gonna get it right back. Cause it don't stop, won't stop, can't stop. You understand? Praise be the law. Or do you overstand? Praise be the law. Yes, sir. Yes, Thank sir. you. Is brother Ben here? Brother Ben. Now, Ben got a heck of a program. A lot of people listening to Brother Ben. And Ben tells them about the minister. And Ben tells them about the minister.